I am Jeffrey Kluger, author of Apollo 8 and editor-at-large at Time Magazine. I'm John Sterling, the editor of Apollo 8. Jeff, in the summer of 1968, NASA tore up the schedule and decided to launch the first mission to the moon, and to do so in just four months. Uh, it was not impulsive, but it certainly was risky. Right. Why did they do this, and why did they feel confident that the mission would succeed? Um, there are a lot of answers to that question. One of them is, I'm not sure they were entirely confident the mission would succeed, but I think they thought they had a very good shot. And here are the factors that were playing into it. President Kennedy had promised that we would get men on the moon by the end of 1969. It was now 18 months, 16 months before that deadline, and we had not had a man in space for close to two years. So the clock was ticking. There was an urgency, a dramatic urgency, a political urgency to do this. So that was a part of it. The other part was it was entirely true that the Saturn V, the great moon rocket that would be needed for the mission, wasn't ready, that the Apollo spacecraft itself wasn't ready, that the lunar module that would need to be ready for a, an eventual landing also wasn't ready. But what they knew was we have the wherewithal to fix this rocket. We have the wherewithal to fix the Apollo orbiter. Put the lem aside for a moment. Put the lander aside for a moment. Are we capable of doing this? And if we are capable of doing it, is there an argument for not doing it? And that's what I think the brass of NASA did so creatively. They flipped the valence of the question. The question did not any longer become, we must justify why to do this. The valence became, we must justify why not doing it. If we believe we can fix this spacecraft, if we believe we can fix this rocket, and we believe we have three astronauts who can fly this mission, and NASA had no shortage of very good astronauts, then the question became, why should we not at least try it? That didn't mean that there wasn't a lot of work to be done, and when I was working on the book, John, you were very clear in asking me, insisting that I had a long passage explaining just what needed to be fixed in that critical 16 weeks, the software and the engines and everything else that needed to be done, and they were able to do it in that 16 weeks. So basically, when that question first came up, why not do it? Why not launch this mission? They knew that it was a crapshoot. They knew that they were taking the entire pile of hoarded chips and pushing them into the middle of the table. But they also knew intuitively, if we get this right, we will stick this mission. Not a landing, but we will stick this mission. And so they did it. Jeff, when the chiefs of NASA called in Frank Borman and Jim Lovell and Bill Andrews, called them to a secret meeting, and asked them if they would accept an assignment to fly to the moon. They all accepted immediately. Yes. Uh, did they understand the risks? And if they did, how did they feel about them? I think they understood the risks. And I think that speaks to something about the mental software of a pilot that most of us don't have. I asked Jim Lovell once before I actually was talking about Apollo 8, even though we weren't writing Apollo 8 at the time, we were writing Apollo 13, and I said, imagine that this is your living room the night before you leave to go into to astronaut quarantine before Apollo 8. You look around the living room, you say, I'm leaving here tomorrow morning. If this mission doesn't work, I'm never going to see this room again. And Jim said to me, if you thought that way, you simply wouldn't go. And that is something that we don't grasp about pilots. They know that they're doing something that could plausibly result in their deaths. They know that they're doing something that will leave their wives widows and their children half orphans. And yet they've decided, this is the calculus I have chosen to live with every day of my professional life. For Frank Borman, as the commander of the mission, it was a battle in the Cold War. And his attitude was, I may not be in a shooting war, but like any other war, when your commander 
and in this case, somewhere along the line, that commander indicated included his president. When your commander gives you a battlefield assignment, you say yes. In the case of Lovell, it was partly that he just loved flying in space. He absolutely adored it. He was never so happy as when he was in space. He was never so happy in space as when he was doing something crazy and complicated, which is one of the best things about the fact that poor Jim was the commander of Apollo 13 when everything blew up, because it may have been a terrible six days, but man, he had a lot of fun stuff to do to keep alive. Um, in the case of Bill Anders, it was his first mission. He had hoped to fly a mission that would include a lunar lander, the lunar module, which was this wonderful, ugly, eccentric, improbable machine that he just loved for all of those reasons, that it was just a, a bizarre piece of machinery, but it worked beautifully. He wanted to fly it. This mission wouldn't have it. So for him, it was a disappointment. On the other hand, the consolation was, I'm still young, I'll get another mission. And it's not a bad thing that my very first rookie mission will be the first flight to the moon. So for all of them, they came at it with different, different reasons, but every single one of them came to it with a great big happy yes. And did NASA ever give a, an honest uh, estimation of the odds? Uh, NASA chose not to do that specifically, but the astronauts themselves were capable of crunching those numbers. Um, Bill Anders uh, believed, and he told his wife, that they were operating on 33, 33, 33 probabilities. There was a 33% chance that the mission would be completely successful, a 33% chance that they would go out there and have to return and not successfully orbit, but come back safe and a 33% turn uh, chance that they were gonna leave Earth and not return alive. Um, Susan Borman, Frank Borman's wife, uh, who was in some ways the most anxious, the most uh, highly strung of all of the astronauts' wives, um, had a frank conversation with Chris Kraft, the chief of flight operations, and she may not have liked to hear bad news, but she deeply admired Chris Kraft because he was just brutally candid. And she asked him and said, look me in the eyes. Tell me what the odds are. And Kraft said, you really you want to know this, don't you? And she said, yes, I do. And he said, 50-50. 50-50, they come home. So those were the numbers she was working with. Jim just didn't work with numbers. He was just, he was having too much fun. So he figured, I'll figure it out when I get there. <laughs>